Well, good afternoon. If you are in New York or Boston or any place with a big Irish community, good evening. If you're in Dublin, hello to people all around the world, especially in Japan. I know they're listening to us tonight, today and tonight. And my guest today is a friend of mine whom I've known for a long time, Connor Hanratty in Dublin. Are you in Dublin right now? I am indeed in Dublin at home. And I'm going to start by defining you as a director, but you are much more than a director. Okay, I'll define you now. You are a man of the theater. You're a man of opera. You are an author. You're a scholar. You are multilingual and not just Gaelic and English, but other languages as well, including Japanese. And I'm sure the operatic languages you speak Spanish? I think so also a bit. I do indeed. Yeah. Now, why is it that you speak so many languages? Well, um, when I was in secondary school, high school, um, I was educated by the Jesuits. And one of the options was to study Latin and the other was to study Greek. And the, the Latin was kind of, it was compulsory. We weren't allowed to not pick that. But I chose to study ancient Greek because a very enthusiastic teacher pitched it to us. And... I, I figured this would be worth doing. And as a result of that, they're kind of good building blocks then for, for languages in general. And I, I loved French when I was younger and I stuck with that. Um, and then I got a degree in Latin. It was a, a two subject degree in, in drama and Latin. In case the drama didn't f- work out, I had something to fall back on. And um, I suppose I've always been interested in language in general. And then opera is a great job for communicating in multiple languages. And so yeah, here I am with a number of them under my belt. My mother studied at a Jesuit university here in New York called Fordham University, a wonderful school. And she studied ancient Greek as well. And her teacher was very elderly and she was not young when she went to college. She went in middle age. And she used to say that she studied ancient Greek with a native speaker. (laughs) (laughs) With an ancient Greek. (laughs) Exactly. And her focus in her studies was about uh, what she called vision and responsibility and vision and philosophy in the ancient Greeks and how just about every single thing that the ancient Greek writers, playwrights, thinkers studied and thought about and wrote about still informs the way our world is discussed today. Connor, I wonder if you think that they just knew more initially or whether they created the template for what the world discusses. I, that's a brilliant question. Um, I spent a lot of last year with the ancient Greeks. Um, I made a show uh, for the internet. Um, it, was, it was going to be a production and then it became something else and it became a podcast about Aeschylus' Persians because last year was 2,500 years since the battle it describes. So I spent a lot of time actually with, with Greek tragedy. And I think that this, this moment happened when you know democracy and theater were invented in the same cultural climate and far more eloquent people than I am have been capable of, of linking the two and why they both came to exist. But certainly th- this is a moment when sort of humanity was moving forward, whether that was from the ancient gods into gods that looked more like humans and then maybe the next step was beyond that but whatever happened in that crucible in that city was something very very special and I I don't know I I think we have at least equaled it since and you know we're living in this incredible moment of technology and of science and science is hopefully vaccinating us right now so there are there are great things but if I could time travel to anywhere, hopefully with one of those language things like in Star Trek, so I could speak to them, my ancient Greek is a bit rusty now. Um, I would absolutely go back to Athens then and see how this kind of happened and what it was like. In reading about, not in preparation to talk to you, but just because I like to read this stuff too, although not as deeply and not in the original language as you do. In Periclean Athlon, Athens, they had a plague they had a big pandemic, something like one third of the population was killed, died Mm -hmm. in that pandemic. Do you and your studies go back and see how they reacted? And I I don't mean 
medicinally necessarily, but theatrically or philosophically or religiously? Absolutely. I mean, I think they, I, I love whenever we can get a glimpse into the cultural concept or the context that will have given birth to something. You know, the, the big talking point last year as well, that Shakespeare wrote King Lear during a plague. And um, maybe that's true. Maybe it's not. All it did, it seems, was put pressure on out of work artists in 2020 going, what am I supposed to do is write King Lear. But um, for, for Athens, I think it is very interesting that Sophocles wrote Oedipus the King or Oedipus the Tyrant. And that is a play that responds to a, a rot in the city. And of course it's it's corrupt politics and there's the, the very problematic relationship at the heart of all of it and the curse has been fulfilled and so on. Um, but I, I won't quite quote the, um, what they called Oedipus in Harlem uh, came up a lot last year as well and how the, the civic responsibility was to get rid of said person um, in the hope of healing thereafter. Um, so there was an interesting tie in with, with politics around the world, but also with with the arts. And, you know, very importantly, the arts have always been the recourse, even in horrendous times, like a pandemic, like a plague, like any sort of awful thing that we've lived through. It was an Irish American who made good, John Fitzgerald Kennedy, who said that we look to the arts to understand the cultures and civilizations. If we read politics, if we read about this war happened at this time and those people died. We don't really understand. We just know the facts. Mm -hmm. And therefore he put front and central the arts. And that's why in Washington, D.C., the Kennedy Center was named for him. He died tragically. And his widow, um, Jacqueline Kennedy, then later Jacqueline Kennedy Onassis, with the help of Dwight D. Eisenhower, the previous president, who also loved the arts, and with the help of Lyndon Baines Johnson, created the Kennedy Center for the Performing Arts. And I imagine you've been there, and we'll talk about that later. But a question that you elicited for me regarding King Lear is a global question regarding being a director, but let's focus on King Lear. Does knowing that King Lear might have been written during a plague inform how, number one, you might direct it, and number two, how you would want audience members to receive it? Or is it really what comes from the page? Interestingly enough, I'm directing King Lear at the moment. Um, and I don't know if I told you that, but um, no. I don't, there's not a lot about that in the play, to be honest. Um, it, it's a happy coincidence that, you know, scholars have an idea of when the play was first performed. So therefore they've extrapolated that Shakespeare must have written it at this time. And that time also had a plague. That's about as much as we have. And I mean, I love theorizing about the life of Shakespeare. I think it's, it's, it's really interesting and it's, it's playful and entertaining, but we don't have facts. And the play doesn't really have a huge amount to say about it. Actually, Romeo and Juliet would be much more interesting because the whole story there revolves around an outbreak of the plague. If Verona wasn't shut down because of the plague, the letter would have reached Romeo. He wouldn't, have, and they wouldn't have died. So that uh, I did a, a bit of work on the play last year, and we we did do a whole pandemic lockdown quarantine. I want to talk to you about that production, yeah. But the Lear, I don't know. And for all of our, there there are two separate kinds of knowledge as well. The cultural context stuff is great. And it's really exciting to read that and know what was happening and what Shakespeare might have eaten while he was writing the play. But then you come into a rehearsal room and most of that is not very useful. So anything that is will stay, but I think you have to approach it fresh. And it is, it is about the performers who are in the room. Uh, it, it can be about who is going to come and see it, um, but particularly it is, it is about whatever alchemy is going to happen on the basis of the process that is starting with all the people involved, rather than we know this, we have to respond to it having been written in a plague because we were told. I, I, I don't think that is, and that, that goes for most artworks and most texts that get brought to, to a table where I might be working. Prior to the pandemic, I famously was out six or seven nights of the week and often during the day in matinees, when I was not working, of course, or even when I was working and going to theater, going to concerts, going to opera, of course, 
uh, going to a lot of film. I happen to be a big film lover and cinema lover. People don't necessarily know that about me. And I teach uh, courses on Fellini, for example. I did one recently in Massachusetts, well, in New York to Massachusetts. And so I'm very engaged with all of this. And I noticed that I saw a lot of King Lear productions. And I'm not tired of King Lear. I'm open to all of the interpretations one can see. I know that uh, in the summer, actually in June, so recently, um, the, in St. Louis, they did King Lear with the actor Andre de Shields, a wonderful American actor, no more for his music, but he's a wonderful actor for everything. And I know that there are just certain operas and certain plays that I want to give a rest to, and I think maybe deserve a rest and not just for me. Hmm. If I don't see La Boheme for a while, that's fine. It's a masterpiece, but I, I'm tired of La Boheme and I'm tired of the magic flute. Those two can rest for a while. Uh, there are many, many other works that I can see endlessly. I can see Rigoletto and Andrea Chenier endlessly and Falstaff endlessly and Fidelio endlessly. But somehow Bohem and Flute are, I'm a little tired of. I reached tiredness with Hamlet and I gave him a rest, but now I'm ready for Hamlet again. We're going to talk about Hamlet later. <laughs> but right now the Shakespeare play that I just think needs to rest for a while is King Lear. What do you think? I think King Lear is the darkest of all of his plays. Um, and I think its final scenes are immensely powerful. I mean, like I said, I'm, I'm working on a very reduced version of it at the moment. Um, and even... One daughter? It, well, three actors altogether. So one playing Lear and a bunch of, well, he plays Lear and he plays Edmund for a very small bit. One okay. plays Kent and both daughters and other things. And then the third plays Cordelia and the Fool and a few other necessaries. Good. So it was a sort of a dramaturgical hack job yeah. to, to dismember the play and then save the vital organs. Um, but even with all of that done to it, the final scene of the recognition between Lear and Cordelia, there's something immensely beautiful and powerful and, and, and important in it. And, you know, this year's Best Actor Oscar went to a performance of a father who is slowly losing himself. And, you know, that, that is a storyline. And, and many of us have spent this last year much closer to our parents or much further away from our parents, in fact, than has been possible before. So that father-daughter, parent-child moment will always resonate, I think, but also it is the darkest, most horrible play. And before we get to that, the worst things are done in that play than are done in any other. And when Cordelia dies at the end, Lear has the most nihilistic line, I think in all of Shakespeare, he just says never five times. And the play is, about, the play is, is set off by the word nothing. And we get from there to absolutely nothing and just about everybody's dead at the end. So maybe this was Shakespeare's response to the plague if you if you need to see that or you want to extrapolate that but it is it's not for a faint-hearted moment and I wonder if we're going to need things that are a little more joyful now so we might have a lot of magic flutes <laughs> but but that, that that's not to say that you know th there shouldn't be muscular nihilist brutal responses to what we've lived through as well because it's not shiny and we have lost a great number of people that we shouldn't have but yeah while i'm working on it i also um i, I will be giving king lear a rest once i finish with it because it's it's not for a faint-hearted moment, certainly. There are many plays, and certainly in Shakespeare, and there are certain operas, such as Mozart's Don Giovanni, where you have role switching, and mm. where two performers could play the same role. And I've always wanted to see if I could manage to go to see King Lear twice in a row, the switching between King Lear and The Fool. And I wanted Ian McKellen and Glenda Jackson to play the role switching from night to night to night because by now they look like one another. Mm. And 
I just think that it would be, and they're wonderful actors, the two of them from, I believe, Manchester in that area. There's a strong political sensibility that they share. And I think it would be very interesting for them to switch off night to night. Also, given that she's in her 80s and he's near that, if not there already, that it would give them a rest from having to do yeah. Lear each night in, in a run. Now, Connor, we're going to talk about Shakespeare because how could we not? He's a great hey. passion of yours. He's the world's most famous playwright. But my favorite Shakespeare play is almost never done. And when I talk to people such as yourself and people who love Shakespeare, who are not working in the profession, and I say my favorite Shakespeare play, they say, no, no, don't tell me, let me guess. They can name 15 plays and not get it. And I'm always surprised because to me, I want to say it's his masterpiece, but it is a masterpiece. I don't know if you want to take two or three stabs. But I you feel know like it's you might have told me before. Pardon me? I feel like you might have told me before, and now I'm ashamed if I've forgotten, but I would say something like Troilus and Cressida or King John. I, I feel like it's going to be a deep cut for you, for sure. But tell me, I, as long as it's not the Merry Wives of Windsor. <laughs> <laughs> Anthony and Cleopatra. Oh, of course. It, and everyone's it's a masterpiece. Says, oh, of course. Everyone, of course. <laughs> but that's the unrecognized masterpiece. And I have been known to travel to a city if I know that they're going to do Anthony and Cleopatra. And saw it, I guess, two or three years ago. I'm suddenly forgetting the actress's name, a black actress, a British black actress, uh, Sophie something, and Ray mm -hmm. Fiennes. And... Sophie Okonedo, is that her name? That's, yes. Yes. And they were fantastic. And the production was great. It was at the National Theater. And obviously that's been source material for opera and for film. And I love that Shakespeare created a very strong woman character there. And I, you don't see that that often. You know, you have Lady Macbeth, who's a harridan, a smart harridan, but a harridan. And you have extreme types, you have Gertrude, you have troubled types such as Ophelia, uh, but a great female leading character who's smart on her own. Can you name me another one in Shakespeare who can match Cleopatra? I don't think anybody matches her. I think she's, no. out, she's out there on her own, but Volumnia, Could Rosalind. Be. Rosalind in her um, way, but we think of Rosalind as being smart and able, but not the same degree. She's not an adult in quite the same no, way. No. Um, I think if Beatrice had a couple more scenes, maybe. Mm -hmm. um, but it's a comedy and it's short. Um, yeah. I, I think Cleopatra is the most extraordinary woman in Shakespeare, for sure. Because you have smaller roles of women. I'm suddenly forgetting she's sort of the the nurse in winter's tale oh paulina, paulina she's my favorite yeah paulina can put people mm. straight but yeah. it's a much smaller role mm -hmm. but cleopatra embraces her own destiny she's like dido in in the trojans and les troyennes and she's up there with great greek characters and great operatic characters and anthony is a wonderful character too and to me, it's a great play. Do you have any notion about why it's just not done very often? It's very big. And there is a very, very large cast of characters and it is not short. So that's a lot of resources that have to go into a production. And also, Cleopatra is also one of the most famous women in history. You know, up there, like Helen of Troy, it's very hard and enormous pressure on an actress to be cast in that. Now, the most... Uh, wonderful stories of it are when, when Judy Dench did the, the role for Peter Hall and everybody was, was sort of horrified that this rather short not as young as she used to was lady was going to take it on and of course she was transcendent because she mm -hmm. is Judy Dench and she, she rightly should have been but the, the the casting of it is you have to get it right or you have to do something very very interesting with it um 
and it, 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 like I said, it's a long play. So you need an awful lot of, of, of work will have to go into it to, to make it worth the slog. It shouldn't feel like a slog when it's done well, but when it's not, it, it can be. <laughs> well, I know that there are other Shakespeare plays where I get restless. Uh, a bad performance of Hamlet can certainly do that. Uh, really, it can. <laughs> King Lear sometimes. Can I say you're Irish so I can say Macbeth, I think, <laughs> or not? I, I am not an actor, so okay. therefore I, I, I understand. I'm very Scottish respectful. Yeah. I won't say the name of the play in a rehearsal room because yeah, okay. we have our superstitions and I respect that there is a sure. tradition. Don't worry. <laughs> but uh, I mean, I think Macbeth is a very good play. And in high school, I had a professor, Mr., a teacher, Mr. Schoenberg, who spent four months with us just on Macbeth. And I was so itching to get on to other plays, although he taught it well. But I thought, how much time in, in nine months can we spend on one play? And that was it. And we did because he loved it. And it, it's a wonderful play. And, I think my second favorite, but for very different reasons, is Romeo and Juliet, which people are surprised when I say that. I don't know why they are, but they are. But I think that the reason that I love it, I think it's the most beautiful language in Shakespeare. And that's why I love Romeo and Juliet. When, mm -hmm. when you hear good actors speak it, it's really extraordinary. And recently there was a production a pandemic production by the National Theatre that was seen on television here in the States and I'm sure in Ireland. With the marvellous Irish Juliet. Yes, she, Irish Juliet. And his name was O'Connor, was the Romeo. Was he Irish as well? Or uh, We'll claim him. He's great. <laughs> okay. And the actors were, were excellent, but I was troubled just not by the staging, which I really embraced. They cut a lot of the text. And I wanted to hear that gorgeous language because we know the story. We know how it comes out. It's the equivalent to me of Bel Canto Opera. Mm. That if you have great singers who can sing the music, we know how these operas end. Or I do, and most of us know with the famous ones how they end. But we go for the music. And with Romeo and Juliet, the play, I go for the music. Because there are opera versions and ballet versions, and I can hear their music from Prokofiev or Gounod in my ears, but I still, in the Shakespeare play, revel in the sound of that language. And, and I don't think there's another Shakespeare play that approaches it great, though his language always is. Do you have do you have favorites in Shakespeare, or let's put it another way, if you don't want to declare a favorite, are there things in particular plays that you especially love? Mm. I do love Romeo and Juliet. Um, a, a very forthright and brilliant academic friend uh, announced to me after I had started working on a production of it that it's a bad play. Um, structurally, she has her issues with it. I don't really care the language of it and also the, the romance of it. I mean, yes, on yeah. paper, it's ridiculous that two teenagers fall in love over a period of three days, wreck their own lives and upend a city. That's kind of glorious as well. Mm -hmm. um, so I love that. Um, I spent the whole of, the, well, the, the second half of last year, I, I read a play a week and I made a podcast about it. So I read them all recently. Um, they don't all need to be on all the time, for sure. Um, I really do love A Winter's Tale, even though incredibly problematic man at the heart of that. But Paulina in particular, putting manners on people. And um, I think the most magical line for us of the theatre is, it is required you do awake your faith. Um, that, Not the line wonderful. about the bear? Uh, no, he, 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 he's been and gone by then. <laughs> um, you know, the I, I want, years ago, I, I guess people could look it up if they want. I did an article about bears in opera theatre. <laughs> 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 because I just seen Winter's Tale with Kenneth Branagh and Judy Dench in London, mm -hmm. and um, a disappointing lack of a bear in that production. I know that, I know, but sometimes they have the shadow of a bear. But mm -hmm. Siegfried has a bear, and the Bartered Bride has a bear, and you know, bears can be menacing, but they can also be adorable. Indeed, and indeed, you know, teddy bears and honey bears and all of that, <laughs> and the thing about opera and theater is that they offer us the world and, and including that are bears. But uh, that Winter's Tale is a very disjointed play, but a very beautiful play. Mm -hmm. 
And it, it is among my favorites as well. Another one of my very favorites that I alluded to a bit earlier is Pericles. Uh, <laughs> Peri have, you, have you ever worked on Pericles? Um, yes, when I, in my final year of um, my degree, my undergraduate degree, um, our professor uh, was teaching a, an acting Shakespeare course. And I auditioned to get into the class because of the Shakespeare and slightly overlooked the fact that the other half of its title was acting. And we acted every week and learned a lot of, a lot of sonnets and a lot of scenes and did a lot of work. Uh, but by the end of our, our first of two semesters in the class, we were all kind of itching to do something more than just a showcase for our acting. And so Professor Dennis Kennedy, who tremendous teacher, um, decided that we would do parakeets. And so we put on the play because it, it gets done very, very seldom. And we put it on in the summer in like a, a, a dance studio at the top of our department. And we had a ball. At the same time, the production by Nina Gawa, the Japanese director that I would go on to work with, was happening in London. So I got to take a weekend off and go to London and see that. And that was a landmark. Uh, Nina Gawa's version of it, um, which I, <laughs> I feel like I'm name dropping now or... or humble bragging you can read about it in my book um but the we're gonna that production get to nina gower we're gonna devote a lot of time <laughs> to him and to your time in japan but certainly that pericles in particular was a, a a turning point for me when i thought wow this is what on the page pericles is faintly ridiculous and it's not all by shakespeare according to them who tell us these things and it, it is a bit odd but I've seen it about six times on stage and every time an audience is just enraptured by the end of it. Again, family reunions and the, the restoration of faith. I, these are very potent drugs and they work. <laughs> so many Shakespeare productions, because he is, he belongs to the world. He was born in England, but he really does belong to the world. And I've seen Shakespeare acted in languages that I don't speak. And they're fantastic. One of the best uh, performances of Othello I have ever seen was in Latvia. And I don't know a word of Latvian or Russian. And, but the performance was magnificent. And I knew everything happening because I knew the play, of course, but also because the way they felt it, the way the language they spoke, which was Russian, had a beauty and a pathos and a pain to it so that the jealousy scenes and the pleading of Desdemona, as she's called in the play as opposed to the opera, um, were riveting. And I've, I speak some German and I've seen many Shakespeare's in Germany and Austria. I've seen it in Italian. I worked on a production of The Tempest with, with uh, Giorgio Streller. And the therefore, production. I was his assistant. Yes, I did not know that. I never told we'll you. Talk. That. <laughs> no. Okay, and, and, oh, I. I, I was, studied that production, and I didn't know. I was trained by Giorgio Streller, among others, but I claim Giorgio Streller primarily. I work with Dario Fo. I work with a lot of people in Italy, Pierluigi Pizzi, a lot with mm -hmm. Franco Zeffirelli, and they would often approach. Well, not Streller, but the other guys would approach it with a very Italianate touch. Streller was a thing unto himself. But the, the thing is, so Shakespeare belongs to the world. We don't have to confine him. Thank goodness we don't have to confine him to races where we just have, you know, white English looking people in the roles uh, or Italian looking people or African looking people. We're glad we don't have to do that. Um, because I've seen magnificent actors and actresses of all colors, races, genders, and so on, doing all these roles. But I feel that Shakespeare, if we listen, if it's well-spoken and well-directed, but especially well-spoken, is relevant already. And that what the actors and the director need to do is help unlock that rather than setting it in a quote, relevant place or context. What do you think? Mm. I, for the most part, I agree. Um, I think it, directing a Shakespeare play, you sort of have to build a bridge from where we are to where the, the play might be. 
uh, and that can be a very small bridge and sometimes it needs to be a little bit bigger. Um, I, I'm much more interested in inviting an audience to the world of the play rather than dragging the world of the, uh, dragging the play, kicking and screaming into our world. So much of how we exist in the world, whether that's with a mobile phone in our hands or a gun, uh, they're not part of how the musculature of those plays work. And sometimes it's fun to put them into and see and you juxtapose them and you get interesting new things that happen. Um, <coughs> but sometimes it doesn't work and it just feels a little decorative. Um, I, I, I would, I, I don't have any absolutes because I don't think there are any absolutes in this. Sometimes um, people can, can make it a highly contemporary version of it and it's transcendent. And sometimes it can be dreadful. <laughs> mm -hmm. There's, so I, I think the language is tantamount and there is a music to that and an excitement to that. The only thing what I really, really hate is when people try and translate Shakespeare into contemporary English. Uh, there was a heinous film of Romeo and Juliet a few years ago when the great man who brought us to Downton Abbey decided to to make the play more easy to understand. And it, it, I mean, it's a ghastly thing because you think you're going to be into and it looks like it's going to be lush. And then they start to talk. And for them of us who know the play and so you in particular, I would say if you haven't, do not do it to yourself. Mm -hmm. uh, but the play has been rewritten in quote unquote modern English, but it just it was not for me. <laughs> I'm not sure if I saw that. I may have, but I'm... <laughs> Don't do it. <laughs> okay, all right. Um, you have directed a fair amount of Shakespeare. You've directed many other things. We're going to talk about that. But you and I met in the context of opera rather than so-called legitimate theater, spoken theater, whatever. And... I know many directors who have directed both opera and spoken theater and musicals, which are different from opera. And I'm just going to say that not all of them do it all well. I can think of direct, I'm not going to name people, but I can think of directors who are marvelous at straight theater and musicals and just terrible at opera. I can think of wonderful opera directors who don't quite have the touch for spoken theater. Would you talk about what you perceive as the requirements to successfully direct opera, to successfully direct Broadway musicals or operettas or things where there's comedy and dance in a different way, and to direct a spoken play, whether it's a tragedy such as King Lear or a comedy such as The Odd Couple? Oh, The Odd Couple. <laughs> Um, I could try and thread a through line through them all and say the, the most important thing is listening to the music of the piece itself. And of course, that's a loaded term already, that, you know, to say that the odd couple has a music, but I think it does. Um, it has a rhythm. A rhythm. There we go. Yeah. And a music, I think. Um, obviously, in opera, one is helped by having the music on the page. Um, for directing opera... The best thing is that I have a buddy in the room, and I hope they are a buddy, uh, in the music, the musical director and the conductor, uh, in, in that you're not in there alone and there are there are two interpreters. Um, enlisting them early is usually wise because teamwork in, in that kind of a situation is a whole lot better than having conflicting opinions. Um, but I love that there are collaborators like that in a room. Um, for opera, the world moves a little more slowly in that um, a, a conversation in opera can be 10, 15 minutes long uh, on the page in a spoken word play. That could be one minute. In a Harold Pinter play, it could be half an hour. <laughs> but again, that does depend on the women. And in Samuel Beckett, how long? Eternity. Uh, I think they're still waiting on the side of the road to find <laughs> out. <laughs> um, the, but the... The interpretive approach can be the same for all of them. I mean, I mean there are different rules in, in a room. Um, sometimes opera singers respond a whole lot more to um, acting notes, sometimes not. Uh, sometimes to very abstract notes, like could that be a little warmer or very much directly, please sing it at him because you want to do whatever you want to do to him. Um, whereas in... 
in a, in a spoken word play, I think there's a lot more play. Like we play games in a very different way uh, because there were a few people in the room on the clock. You know, there, there is, I, I'm always conscious that there is a repetitor at the piano, there is the conductor and so on. So there can be a little less freedom, but not in a bad way just that there, there are other jobs to be done and there are other people whose rehearsal it is that, you know, the, the music has to be rehearsed in the conditions of the performance of the action of the scene. Whereas in something like The Odd Couple, uh, we played a lot of Trivial Pursuit as we were preparing that, which actually kind of forced personalities to emerge in a very interesting way. Um, and then for uh, a, a big musical theatre comedy, there's going to be a whole lot of choreography as well. And um, knowing what you want is very important. And preparation is, is really is everything. Um, I, I am not doing my job properly if I walk into a room first thing in the morning and say, so what are we doing today? And if I do, it's because of something beyond me, whether that's a playwright who doesn't want to talk about developing the play or many other things. I have been that director on occasion. I'm not... Uh, saying that we don't all have moments when we arrive and there are other things happening, but generally preparation so that um, you can see when something is working and build on that. And if it's not, you know, and you can try and fix it quickly. Uh, uh, what's coming to my mind right now is having worked on um, Francesca Zambello's production of Candide, um, which was built initially for the Glimmerglass Festival and then went to, to other places as well but the, the rigor of that. And also we were uh, working on a, a version of the text. And I mean, that is a huge show. And it, it, it kind of like Proteus, it keeps changing in the water constantly. It's shape changed. Uh, and we added an, an, an entire musical number that had been cut. Cheska with her excellent eyes and ears just thought, I think we need it after all. So after our final tech, the whole number was staged and put back into the show. And, mm. you know, that that was, I mean, it was extraordinary and exhilarating, but also as a director watching somebody go, the show does need this after all, and we're going to do it in the 45 minutes we have available. And we did. And it brought the house down. So I want to talk to you a bit later about directing produ existing productions. Mm -hmm. And you were talking about working with a living playwright. You don't get to talk to Ibsen or Chekhov or Euripides. Sadly, but, no. <laughs> I have I mean, a lot of questions. You, you <laughs> might, but you know, have a seance. But I, while you were talking, I thought of something that to me has been so obvious and self-evident for my whole working life that I've never brought it up, but it, it bears mentioning, namely, in directing opera and in directing musicals, although it's slightly different, you have the fact that you have the performers on the stage looking at a conductor occasionally, whereas people in a straight play are not looking at someone in front of them. They're not necessarily, unless the playwright asks for it, they're not speaking directly to the audience. They are interacting with one another. That integrity, let's call it, that one has in a straight play can be imposed, imported, can influence a production of an opera or a musical play, musical theater. But I know many singers who, especially if they're new to a role, especially if they're having a bad night vocally, may say, I need to look at the maestro. The maestro needs to know that I have to stop singing this note because I don't have extra tonight. Mm -hmm. um, there, I don't know if you know the, the wonderful singer Violetta Urmana. She's a Latvian and she's sung mezzo roles and soprano roles, and she's very fearless in a wonderful way. And I like her very, very much. And she was doing a production here in New York of Attila, the Met premiere of Attila, conducted by Ricardo Muti in his only Metropolitan Opera appearance. And I was interviewing her in public and I said, so when you're on stage and you look at Maestro Muti, she said, I don't look at Maestro Muti. He looks at me. <laughs> <laughs> but um, she was half kidding. But on the other hand, what is important in that is that this is a relationship during a performance 
that many audience members are not fully aware of. <clears throat> or if they are, they don't factor it into how a performance is made. But it is a big part of it. So when you direct an opera or to a slightly lesser degree musical theater, do you factor that aspect in your staging that you know that a singer has to be on a mark, not just for the lighting, but also for seeing the conductor and interacting with the conductor? Yeah. I, I think it, it it's a very easy way to get singers on your side is to check with them if there are particular moments when they're going to want to be connected to Maestro. If there are bits where, if it's a breathing issue, if it's a particularly strange setting of music where they have to pluck a note out of somewhere or a timing or a rhythmical thing where they need the support, sure. And what we want is the best product. And while I, I, I value and I'm very proud of what I do, I acknowledge that people are also coming for the music and I'm not going to get in the way of that. Um, generally, it, it, it's no harm and, and there's always a solution that can be found. Um, everything in opera is fake. So if, if I'm sitting there going, oh, it doesn't look real. If oh, I take it. objection to that. Everything opera in opera is real, not fake. Yes, because we make it look real. <laughs> no, it's real because... There's emotional realism in opera. And oh, that, that goes without question. Yeah. So when people but say what I'm to saying me, oh, is... I don't believe it because, you know, she's not pretty, he's fat, whatever. You know, there are plenty of people who do not look like Jonas Kaufman. Pick your beautiful singer. There are many. Renee Fleming, very beautiful, but also supremely talented. We don't all look like that. And we should not look like that. And we should, I don't ever expect that Carmen to be beautiful or Don Giovanni to be handsome. They have other characteristics, they have charisma, they have uh, a whole philosophical approach to their lives, that that's the force in them. But Carmen does not, she has to be alluring and she has to be magnetic. But you can come in any shape or size and be that. But it's and the character that's attractive. And that's what, you know, bringing yeah. that in, that's where it comes from. Absolutely. And Don Giovanni does not have to be a handsome guy at all. He has to, he has to be completely alluring, but so does Scarpia in his strange way in Tosca. Um, mm -hmm. It used to be that we had these heavy bewigged white wigged Scarpias, but now when you direct a, a Tosca and you have a woman who may recognize a certain allure in the Scarpia, that he's the bad guy, but what's wrong with having a bad guy once in a while to, because Mario is such a good guy. <laughs> if that Tosca feels a sexual urge for this bad man, the whole play out of the second act is different because there may be sexual energy and ten tension there, even though she knows that her goal is to save Mario. Mm -hmm. But does she consent because, well, okay, since I have to do this anyway, let me enjoy it. Or is she completely repulsed by him? It's in the music and in the words, but then it's up to the director and the singer, singers in that case, to arrive at that. So here's the question. If you're directing a scene between two people, uh, and it could be a play, an opera, a musical, where there are things going on between the characters that we would call conflict, do you speak privately to the two people and give them notes or actions or thoughts as they enter in it? Not that you're directing them, but you're saying, how do you feel about him? And I don't mean the performer, but, but the yeah. character. And are you drawn to him? Is, is there any good aspect of Scarpia, Miss Tosca that you feel? Or do you, do you speak to them privately and give them notes ahead of time rather than after it's interesting i don't think i would ever do it privately um certainly i would as as we approach going through something again i might say have a think about that but generally both participants will be aware at the same time and they can have um differing uh, opinions to it and i might say to one of them a thing very different to the other but generally, I, I wouldn't side coach and sort of have them surprise each other with, say, you know, I, I would tell Tosca, sing it as if you, you know, really want to jump his bones and tell Tosca or tell, tell Scarpia something completely different. And then they surprise each other in it. 
I might try that, but <laughs> I haven't done it that way. Generally, it would be a conversation between all of us, um, just so that we're, we're on the same page and, and what comes out then can be replicated and, and people are, are able to, to be in it uh, without being surprised in the middle of a note or something like that. Since we're on Tosca, I'm going to stick with that opera for a minute. I didn't plan to at all, but here we are. Puccini in that opera, along with this librettist, but especially Puccini, so precisely laid out the action of the second act in his music. And mm -hmm. he put notes in the score, and, and we know too from the libretto, we know from performance history, performance practice, as it's called, uh, what some of the intentions were. I, in the past 20 years, have seen many directors rebel against that. And audiences, if they know the opera at all, have come to expect that at a certain point, she'll put down a candelabra, she'll spot the crucifix. She will see the note of Buon Condotto, the, the note that allows her to escape from Civita Vecchia along with Mario. All of those things are recognized and Puccini put it there and I, thank Puccini for that because it's a fabulous drama. But nowadays I'm seeing discord between the music and the action that Puccini created and what the directors, I'm going to say, impose. Mm. Do you feel that if there is an opera that has such specificity as Tosca does, Act Two, that it just has to be honored and well-directed or can we go against the grain? I think Puccini was one of the greatest opera directors. It, it also happens to be that he wrote it into his music. Um, I, my experience of his work is more through Bohème. I haven't directed any of his pieces for real, but the, the specificity in the music is so, it's kind of irresistible that if you think about it, the, you, if you pay attention to it, your job is done in that, you know, the, he, he tells you when everything is happening. Um, if you really feel brazen enough to, <laughs> to, to think that you can do better, um, I think the, the works are big enough that they will survive such things. And maybe some such approach might be revelatory, but you want to be really, really specific. And whatever Puccini has suggested, you better do something better in a means, uh, in a way throughout the whole production. So like, if you're gonna throw it out, sure, throw it out, but don't then keep the good bits and throw out other things because then it's just going to be jangled. I would say, I would love to see somebody try and <laughs> out Puccini Puccini with this, but um, it, it's not a, a siren's call that I'm hearing from my own approach. I've never seen a director out of Puccini Puccini, but I did see a singer do it once and in a beautiful way because, and I'm not mentioning her yet, I will mention her after, she made mm -hmm. Tosca her own. She did not have what was called the physique de role. She was very heavy. She was a beautiful woman, but she also had a certain, I don't mean grandeur and physical size, but grandeur and comportment the way Jesse Norman did. And this is not Jesse Norman we're talking about. I don't think Jesse Norman ever sang Tosca, but this was a woman who was so offended by what Scarpio was demanding that everything was driven by that sense of not only revulsion of him, but that he would even suggest that she sleep with him in, in exchange for Mario being set free, though we know he's going to be killed. And therefore in her approach, she resisted him. She was too large in a way to to really get down and dirty on the floor and wrestle with him. And the man who played often played Scarpia with her knew that don't get too close. So how do you act this? And most cases when uh, he says, la mia povera cena fu interrotta, my, my poor little dinner was interrupted. There's a table there. And in some productions he's eating basically a slice of chicken. But in other productions, there's a whole roast beef there with a knife plunged into it. So the Tosca will see the knife in this production. And she'll pull it out, we hope, without having to handle mm -hmm. the roast beef. But <laughs> in many productions, 
the knife is just there. And a lot of times the singer very nervously will feel around to try to find that knife on the table. It's very clumsy. What this particular singer, Montserrat Cavalier, did was as a lady, she decided that if she had to submit to him, she's not going to do it wearing her nice earrings. So as the music play where normally Tosca has to stand there and not have much to do as she's looking at the table and then bam, bam, and the music, and she sees oh, the knife and many singers then do, it's a knife or it's a knife. Cobblier said, well, if I have to sleep with him, I'm not wearing these earrings. These are my precious earrings. So she takes the earrings off and looks at them and then lowers her hands and that's when she sees the knife and she puts the earrings down and then she picks up the knife and it's none of this stuff where, the, where you know, the task is moving about. It was so elegant and it was so perfect and it was so in character for her that although I've seen many putatively better actresses than Montserrat Cabouillet, Cabouillet understood her character so well that she could be a fat Violetta. It didn't matter at all she understood these women and she understood them musically but dramatically and she once said to me that her favorite role was Zalame mm. and she sang a magnificent Zalame and you know we think about you know she joked she said the dance of the 70 veils but um oh, goodness there was once a production where she didn't even dance she just stood there and they had a dancer come out who did the dance of the seven veils and she stood there nobly, but it's as if she envisioned this dance. And Cabrera could do that. Mm -hmm. You know, we had a production in 1973 at the Met that was uh, Ivespri Siciliani, which was a great favorite of James Levine. And Cabrera was engaged to sing Elena. And the production, I may have been John Dexter, I'm not certain, had a lot of steps. And she said, no good, too many steps. I stand here. And she did, and she was fine. And the acting, the sing more than fine, the acting, the singing, all of that was extraordinary. And I had no sense of feeling deprived because Cabrera did not go up and down all those black steps. Which brings me to two questions. Number one, if you're creating a production, do you create it with the scheduled artist in mind, because let's tell our listeners that in theater, the director often gets to pick the cast. In opera, the opera company and the music director usually pick the cast, not the man or woman who's directing the opera. So given that you know in opera that these are going to be your singers, do you design or plot out your blocking with that in mind? or, and this is for a new production, or how do, how do you work that? Do you want to ask the second question or will we go from that? Nope, we'll go after that. Uh, no, I don't. Um, I think it, I, 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 I'm already cautioning myself. It would depend on who they were, uh, because if, if they are uh, who they are, maybe, but even then probably not because, it, uh, you know, I'm not directing, for instance, you know, Salome starring Christine Gerke. I'm just directing Salome and the, the production will be that. And how wonderful if it were Christine in it. Um, but the, it, I'm there to tell a story. And I hope that we would come up with something and plan something that will allow singers to do their best work. Of course, that that is my job. But the... The notion of it, not not enormously. Maybe if something was to do with um, a, a performer's race, uh, one has to be very sensitive to, the, you know, that we don't all look the same, uh, but that we want everyone to look brilliant on stage. And even if that's, you know, for an Electra who's covered in mud, I want the mud to be brilliant. But so th uh, there's a sensitivity in that, but I, I still don't think that necessarily will dictate the design or the concepts? No, I don't think so. The second question is, stage directors, especially when they're younger and starting out, 
or in some cases, people who do this all the time, and they're often called assistant directors, ADs, are called upon to remount or stage an existing production, or where they have the scenery and the costumes already in place, there might be a different cast coming in, a different conductor. And the assistant director, who then is the director, uh, the terminology is strange. In the United States, we call the director of opera a producer. Mm -hmm. whereas elsewhere it might be the regisseur, the director, um, mise-en-scene, there are different words that get used. But in the United States, it's a producer when the production is new, and then a stage director when someone comes in to remount the production. And what we have often is that the original vision belonged to the director who created, the producer who created the production, but then you are called upon to come in often with not much time to take the director's book, talk about what a director's book is when you when we speak, and take that and then mount the production. Uh, how is that different, of course, from creating a new production? Well, for starters, the, the book is everything. It is the Bible. Um, it, it captures uh, entrances, exits, where people stand. Um, depending on how much time you spent with the, if, if I, I've been lucky to have been in the room when a production was created in the first place. So then you're writing down, you know, highlights of the conversation of, of like a bit of the motivation of it, why they turn in this bar. Uh, it, it can be that- um, Bar meaning a video, music. It, yes, not why they went into a bar. Or if it's an Irish <laughs> opera, why you're turning into this bar, of course. <laughs> um the there can be video as well some of my tribe might uh refer more to a video these days or like if there's an archival recording for that uh, that can be very useful for larger crowd scenes or dance numbers or things like that um but essentially uh, the book is the score with as much information as has been recordable recorded in it so so blocking staging um like i said motivation or helpful hints for the performer or for the director to get the performer to a place that as closely replicates the spirit of the original production um so i've done i've done a few operas like that um in some cases i, I was in the room some by francesca zambello mm -hmm. and by thomas yeah. as well thomas um, who was my guest in december He's head of Atlanta Opera, and mm -hmm. people can find that on YouTube. Um, so, so for for instance, for Tomer's production of Silent Night, um, that it originated in Wexford, and I was the assistant director on that. So I was there at the very beginning and saw how it all, where it all came from. Um, but for contrast, then I also remounted one version. Well, I, I I helped to remount. I didn't do it on my own, but I with Garnett Bruce, I worked on Cheska's production of Madame Butterfly which when I first worked on it was already a number of years old. So the book from that was, <laughs> it's old enough. I, I think I can say that you know, Joyce Di Donato was the original Kate Pinkerton in this production. So it dates to when <laughs> Joyce Di Donato would have been playing Kate Pinkerton. Um, and so the opera has moved on. Joyce has certainly gone ever upward. Um, so that, that was really interesting to step into that river that was already flowing and, and, work on that. Um, so it's a question of the, the spirit of it and making sense of it and replicating uh, as closely as possible. If you've, I mean, I was lucky enough to have had access to the intent, you know, I was in the room with Cheska when she had remounted it herself. And then I took it on the road to another company as well. Um, there is a certain amount of trust that is put in you as a, an assistant or an associate director to be delivering that. Um, but you also, what they're really trusting is your judgment in the room, that th there will have to be solutions. Um, the, every company is different and the circumstances that you're given are different. So yeah, it, 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 it's your judgment and your capacity to put on a, an effective and an efficient show and get the very best out of everybody in the room. So you have, you, I mean, whatever about being prepared when it's your own production, which well, of course you should be, when it's somebody else's name on it and you're delivering that, it's it, it, in some ways it's an even bigger responsibility because it's not just your name that's attached. Do you know that Joyce D. Donato is of Irish background? Did you know that? I think Connor is frozen. Maybe I've shocked him into hearing this news. 
the feed has frozen. So I'm going to talk a bit about Joyce Di Donato until Connor comes back and he unfreezes. Uh, this is, there we are. Have we fully oh, I'm frozen? Back. <laughs> okay. You, I, I don't I, know when I cut off. <laughs> what I said to you was, do you know that Joyce Di Donato is of Irish back, background and you froze? Ah, and I do actually. Know, yeah. Yes. She was a Flaherty, wasn't she? She was a Flaherty. Yeah. Uh -huh. And who married a Mr. Di Donato. But and it's a good opera name, Joyce Di Donato, but she's Irish. Mm -hmm. and another person to take pride in. We're going to get back to Ireland later. There, I'm very concerned about certain productions that I love that I know have changed my life. And one of them was Jean Pierre Ponel's production of La Clemenza di Tito by Mozart at the Met. To me, it was just perfect. And mm. on a couple of these other programs with other guests, I've spoken about it, but I'll simply say that it was so rational. It was, but without being dry, it was incredibly passionate. It was very musical. Everything related to the words and to the music and the artists he had initially, including Tatiana Troianos and Sesto, were ideal for the roles. And Ponell unfortunately died quite young and the productions or the restagings of this opera got worse with every single staging, not the casts who have been great. Carol Vaness came in was a magnificent Vitalia, but it got worse because somehow whoever remounted it didn't get what Ponell was after. And I think sometimes there's just a genius director. Uh, the same with Streller. When I see his, we don't see them very often, but when I see his productions mounted nowadays, they don't have the rigor. They don't have the intellect and they don't have the musicality that the initial directors had. And it troubles me because this, I don't ever see La Clemenza di Tito go out of the repertory. It's my favorite Mozart opera, but I would love for someone to capture what Ponell tried to do. And I assume that the Met has uh, the production book. But somehow th there's a moment very late at the end where Titus Tito, at a musical downbeat, extends his hand pointing toward the guilty party, namely Sesto. And when Tatiana Trano sang it, she shot out of the wings. Now... Sesto with his head down comes out of the wings with his hands and chains but this whoosh as Troianos came out on the stage was so thrilling and so correct because it's as if the powerful Titus extended his hand and that brought the prisoner forward and led to what ultimately became a positive resolution of the story. And these details exist in my memory, and they may exist on videos, although they did not make a video of that early enough. Mm. And I mourn for opera productions and theater productions, but especially opera productions that just can't survive. And it's not about the performers. It's about the way they're staged. Is there a way, I know you've worked a lot with these two uh, wonderful directors, Thomas Vulin and Francesca Zambello, who you call Cheska, as a lot of us do, to absorb and transmit what they created. I worked a lot with Zeffirelli and there was a genius, not the easiest man, and, and but I was very fond of him. And Franco had what the Italians call Estro, E-S-T-R-O. Estro meaning this ability to conjure something using your creativity at the moment it's required. And it's all, almost always the right thing. And he had that so completely. And if you watch and learn and you understand the Estro, you could reproduce that. But a lot of times that gets lost in the translation. It can't exist in production books. It has to exist in the witnessing and the passing on to the next person. So you, uh, remind me your age, you're a younger man. I am 40 this summer. Well, you don't look it, but, well, um, but you. you're still <laughs> you're still a young man and oh, therefore sure. you are. And you have absorbed from older, more experienced uh, people. And I'm gonna tell you that I think part of your job, if you don't know this already, 
is to capture their creative impulse and, and not repeat it in your own work unless you choose to. But if you're ever working on their productions or advising assistant directors about this is what they intended. Um, it's kind of like when AIDS came in the 1980s and the ballet world lost so many important figures, men especially, who then could not pass on the knowledge they had. Rudolf Nureyev died at the age of 54 of AIDS. And with him went this storehouse of knowledge that could not be passed on. And I think ballet suffered a lot more in that regard than the other art forms. But it certainly affected opera and spoken theater and everywhere in the arts. And same with the pandemic right now. Um, I've lost friends and colleagues in, in opera, quite a few actually. And we're not aware that these people are necessarily gone. I keep a list, but I've lost personally friends, 17 people of whom 12 worked in opera. And those people are all resources. I'll name one, the conductor, Joel Revson, who was mm. a very wonderful man. He headed Arizona Opera for a while. He and I worked together for decades. And with him went this vast amount of knowledge and ability to be passed on that just went. And that's why I see it as part of my job doing these conversations to document knowledge. It's not just about inspiring people who may watch this during the pandemic or years from now, but documenting what is known so it can be passed on. It's not, it's not showing off. It's about, when I described Montserrat Calvier before in the earrings, it's not to say I knew her, but how she with her size and temperament and everything so beautifully approached her role. So part of your job, my friend, is you have to continue what you've learned and pass it on to as many people. With uh, honor. That, yeah, that doesn't mean we're ending the interview. That just means that <laughs> I'm telling you what you have to do. That's my homework. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. So let's, I, I think that a listener who is just joining us may think, well, he works primarily in Ireland and maybe in England. But you have had an international career for a very long time. Am I correct? You studied at UCLA and worked at UCLA in Los Angeles. I did. And you've worked a lot in Atlanta with Thomas Vulin and various American opera companies in Utah, in mm -hmm. Austin, Texas. But before we go to Japan, which is a big part of your life, talk about your American experience and what you learned and what's different here from what you grew up with in terms of approaches to the art that you do. Well, opera happened for me, I suppose, or began for me. Um, I, when I went to Los Angeles, I went to study directing for, for the stage primarily, uh, but the department there had a very Catholic with a small C approach in that if you came and all you wanted to direct world was opera, they would make um, opportunities for you to do so. They, they would obviously encourage you to, to try your hand at other things as well for your education. But if opera was your focus, that was fine. And uh, the director, James Dara, was the year ahead of me mm, at okay. UCLA. And we had a terrific time there. Um, he had then very conveniently graduated, having made some lovely connections with opera makers around the campus and the city. And he went off and he's doing rather well. And um, the, some of these opportunities remained available. So in my final year, I worked with Peter Cazares on a production of Dialogues of the Carmelites. Peter and I are old friends. Peter was a tenor, very fine right. tenor, and sang a lot at the Met when I worked at the Met. And at a certain point, he migrated from that to direction, production, and now heading the opera department at UCLA. Yes? Yeah. And he, he welcomed me to come and work on that show. And that was my kind of Oprah light bulb moment when I realized that opera Oprah could... Oprah Winfrey, not opera. Opera, Oprah. Oprah, yeah, you name it. <laughs> <laughs> um, the, but the, this production was very, very special, um, both musically, but also personally. Um, and, and the bringing together, I had always been very interested in Greek tragedy, thanks to the Jesuits and the Greeks and so on. But the bringing together of a chorus and of this incredible richness of music on top of things, Plus the, the staging and the language and, and, and Poulenc as well was, was particularly special. 
but that all of these things coming together, I kind of thought, oh, this is a job that I could do. Oh, okay. Um, because curiously, I had not grown up with much opera at all. Uh, I think I was, I was in my 20s before I even went to see an opera in my life. Um, uh, I'm very glad that uh, th this moment happened in my later 20s rather than in my 80s. Um, but the, the, that moment was, was very exciting. And Peter let me direct A Hand of Bridge, which I think is a, a rite of passage uh, for many young directors to have a go at Samuel Barber's perfect 10 minute opera. Um, and I, I think I've done it two times since then as well. I, I'm very fond of that piece. Um, so that was the, the, the beginning of it and the, the surprise, I suppose, of my experience there when I thought I was going to go and direct Shakespeare and maybe some American realism and uh, movies and goodness knows what would lure somebody to Los Angeles. And instead I, I, I wound up with uh, some opera directing credits, which is wonderful. Um, as a result of there, while I was in UCLA and working with Peter, I heard tell of this place called Glimmerglass. And uh, soon after my time at UCLA, I applied to their young artist program and I got accepted. And that was where I got to work with uh, Francesca. Glimmerglass then, being in Cooperstown, New York. So back east, not in, not in California. Not in California. I think the, the weather would be better if it were, but I've been very lucky. The two times that I worked at the festival, um, despite being warned in advance that it would be dreadfully humid and hot, it, it was kind of like spending the summer in Ireland. It was very green and it rained occasionally, but it never got too hot. And I felt very at home there. <laughs> um, so I spent two summers there. And as a result of that, then I got to go and work on Francesca's production of Butterfly in San Antonio. And I had a great time there. And they asked me back the following year to direct a production of Carmen for them. And then at the same time, I was building things up and working in Ireland as well. I've worked a lot with the Royal Irish Academy of Music. And then I was invited to work on the Irish premiere of Nixon in China uh, in Michael Kavanagh's wonderful production. So things started to bubble on both sides of the Atlantic, which was great. And I got to work then for the first time at the Wexford Festival um, in the, the south of my lovely country. And I've directed two short works there and then also uh, asked very nicely if I could work on one of the main stage shows. Uh, so I worked on Christina, Queen of Sweden, which was one of their rediscovered works. And I, I hope that piece goes into the repertory because it's wonderful. And so let's then, talk a bit about Wexford for people who don't know it. It's a darling town. It's, it's just. <laughs> and they created the festival, I believe, in 1950 or 1951. This and is it's the 70th done, year this year. It's done um, in October, typically. So it's not a usual time for a festival. And they have specialized almost since the beginning in primarily presenting works that have been lost or new works. So I've seen Frederick Delius operas there and Mascagni works that are lost and many Donizetti. There's a very strong Italian influence there. I had Francesco Cilufo, who is one of their wonderful directors. He's an a conductor. He's an Italian. But, you know, when I talked to Francesco, he looks forward to going to Wexford each year because he stocks up on Irish oatmeal and porridge to bring <laughs> home to Milan and Irish honey and different things. He loves Ireland and they love him there. And he studied not only in Italy, but also in London. So he, his English is beautiful. And I adore Wexford and you've worked there. You have anything coming up there? Yes, uh, I'm going to be directing this year a uh, production of Bellini's um, Montagues and Capulets. So they've ah. cottoned on that I like Shakespeare and I get to bring the Shakespeare and the opera all together this, this autumn. I'm very excited. Wait a minute, it. you say Montagues and Capulets, isn't it Capuletti and Montecchi? Yes, well, I'm, not, I'm, not, I'm not playing any favourites there and saying who comes first. <laughs> <laughs> That's it's a wonderful opera. I think in many ways, it's one of the best expressions of Romeo and Juliet. I love the Gounod music, mm -hmm. but somehow they really captured the flavor of the relationship between Romeo and Juliet better in the Capulets and the Montagues. Uh, I saw a production of that in Paris a few years ago where Romeo was Joyce Di Donato and uh, Julietta, Juliet, was an eight-month pregnant on a Netrebko. 
and <laughs> this is why Dekrebko, I love opera. <laughs> <laughs> Anna Dekrebko, for the most part, sat in a chair and everything happened around her. <laughs> and but I've seen pregnant Lucia's at New York. We once had a seven month pregnant Lucia, even though she has not slept with anyone and you know, <laughs> she kills her husband on her wedding night. But she's pregnant anyway. And, you know, you get around, literally, you get around that. But talk about the atmosphere of Wexford, which is very special. Well, it's, it's a very small town in the best possible way. And everybody's, their eyes glaze over when you mention it. Anybody who's ever worked there in the arts in Ireland was like, oh, it, like it's a, it's a lovely rite of passage and it's a great thing. And it's just... It, the opera takes over the town for the six or seven weeks that rehearsals are going on. Um, you have three main stage productions happening and rehearsing full time in rep. And also the, there is a, a degree of sharing of performers. So a main role in one opera might have a very smaller role or a cameo in another. And then there's the wrestling match for scheduling and for rehearsal availability. As well as all of that, there are also side works and short works. So there'll be lunchtime performances for younger directors like I was the last time I was working there um, that happen um, not on the main stage, but in other venues around. So there's a huge buzz of activity. You have a whole company that descends and they come from all over the world, but particularly there, there are a lot of Italians. So the, the lingua franca of the town changes to an extent and but there's a competition on the main street for the shop windows for whoever puts on the best display that responds to the shows of the particular year. Um, Simon's Pub is the hub uh, at particular times of the day um, to go and meet. If you're meeting anybody, that's where you're going to meet them. It's just, it's a tremendous, it's not quite like summer camp because it, it, the coldest winter you'll ever spend is a summer in Wexford. But, um, or San the, Francisco. You know the quote. Yeah. Um, the, the the spirit of it and the the volunteering of everybody in town who pitches in and everybody is invested in making the festival work and that is an absolute miracle of of goodwill but also of tradition and local pride. It, it's it's a very special place. A few years ago, they opened a new theater there, and it's a very nice theater. Uh, it feels like an opera house, but not overbearingly so. It, it's intimate. It works well for the town. And I guess because they're Irish, just about everyone is very warm and friendly. Um, I've had, you're my third Irish guest of this series. The first one I had was the singer Tara Erot, a uh, wonderful mezzo-soprano. And the second, just around St. Patrick's Day, but that was a coincidence, was Deborah Kelleher, who's the head of the Royal Irish Academy of Music. And I invite listeners to look on YouTube and find those two before um, too long, because you want to hear Connor right now and then immerse in the full Irish and hear <laughs> the other two. Now, what Deborah and Tara both spoke to me about in part, and I want to ask you about is we recently in April lost the wonderful singer, teacher, uh, Veronica Dunn, Ronnie Dunn. And would you talk about her and what she meant? Certainly Tara was her prize student and she taught at the Royal Irish Academy of Music, but you as an Irishman who works uh, in the theater, in the theater mm. and- <laughs> mm -hmm. and can have opera. one of them. <laughs> Talk about what she meant to Ireland and to the, the performing arts. It's very difficult to put in words. I mean, this lady was in her 90s and still going strong. Um, the most formidable teacher. I mean, the, the greatest honor you could have would be to be picked as one of Ronnie's. This is not to say anything about all of the other amazing voice teachers and so on in the country. And terrific work is done in many institutions. But Ronnie was very special and very particular. And the, the kind of imprimatur of being her student would send you places. Um, she was an indomitable person. I mean, the, the first time I was directing at the Academy, she, she just popped into rehearsal unannounced. And here I have this living legend, national treasure, just wandering in to have a look at how things were going. And of course, to see how her charges were going to be in the show. 
And I think she was giving me a note and I kind of thought, oh, this is sink or swim now. And I'm going to have to tell her no, because what she's saying won't work for the rest of the show. <laughs> so I stood up and I said, here's why. Thank you. Thank you. But here's why. And she said, oh, OK, you've thought about it. And I was I was left alone. then. <laughs> <laughs> but this this was somebody who had a, a, a talk about transmission and of tradition and knowledge she knew everybody she had sung and she had performed in so many places and then she had taught everybody so the, we have what we have lost with her passing is a huge chunk of of tradition and i mean uh, my my father's sister was uh, a, an amateur opera singer and she sang in the course i mean her greatest achievement was she sang with pavarotti but when she saw that ronnie dunn came to a show that i directed that that was when i had become the real deal not it didn't matter if there was nobody else in the audience but the fact that Ronnie came that was something very special indeed I described her as the most formidable formidable Irish woman since Isolde uh, I think you're pretty accurate there yeah <laughs> she was really quite something but I, I do want to say that what the Royal Irish Academy of Music very very intelligently did was they had Ronnie Veronica Dunn teach singers i'm sorry teach teachers how to sing and how to teach so the veronica dunn method you can't be veronica dunn but her approach her philosophy has been imbued in many dozens and perhaps more of teachers who are now teaching all around ireland and elsewhere mm -hmm. but especially ireland so that in a way was the best use of her musical dna if we want to think of it that way and transmitting it. Um, so now if we've left the United States and Ireland, of course, I'd like to go with you to Japan because anyone looking closely sees that behind you are posters and art from Japan. <laughs> and you have distinguished yourselves many, yourself in many ways, but one of them is that you did this total immersion into Japanese theater art and especially the work of Yukio is it Yukio Yukio or yeah Yukio Ninagawa mm -hmm. talk about him I, he lived 1935 to 2016 and talk about his art and why you were drawn to him and and then we'll get more into what he did well, right about the same time that I was deciding to study ancient Greek I was in my early teens my tremendous mother recorded from the Open University on the BBC, a, a program about Greek tragedy. And in the middle of this, they used clips from a Japanese production of Medea. And another moment, I saw that and I thought, that is, that is it. I, well, I don't know what they're talking about, but I know that that is amazing and I want to find out more. And it was a production by him. And so I did study Greek in school. Medea the Euripides. Euripides Medea. Not, not the French, I forget who did that, but... No, no, this is yeah. Euripides Rossi, translated yeah. by a, a, right. a Japanese poet into Japanese. Um, one of his, his biggest successes, and it made it as far as the BBC. And so that was kind of it. And then when I saw at the end of my degree, uh, an opportunity to go and study in Japan, um, it, it, there's a, a scholarship that the Japanese government uh, has. All countries with whom they have diplomatic relations um, are entitled to apply. Generally, they go to, I won't say, quote unquote, real jobs like um, lawyers or historians or any anything other than theatre. Uh, but I pluckily went into my interview at the Japanese embassy and I said, there's this director and I think he's brilliant and I want to go and learn more. And they said, OK. And they gave it to me and I went and I um, inveigled my way into uh, a very prestigious, I didn't know this at the time, it's a very prestigious university, but they had an English language page on their website through which I could contact them. So that, that was my choice, but it worked. And so I spent my first year in Japan, as you say, completely immersed, uh, desperately, desperately trying to learn the language. And then very happily, I met the English, tremendous English lady who brought Ninagawa's work to London. Uh, was there for a tour of another thing she had done. And I went and I found her in the bar of a Tokyo hotel, as Tennessee Williams would put it. And we had a tremendous conversation. And she said, I'm having lunch with Big Nina. And only she was allowed to call him that. Um, 
the following day, but I'm leaving the hotel at eight o'clock in the morning. So if you have a letter here in Japanese by then, I'll endeavor to introduce you. Uh, one of the most sleepless, frantic nights of my life, calling up and texting and messengering everybody I knew who could in any way help me to write as good a letter as possible in Japanese. And then Tokyo rush hour the following morning back to the hotel and I got it handed in. And the following Monday or Tuesday, I was in his rehearsal room, thanks to a very nice introduction from Thelma. And I stayed for a year. I know that he loved Shakespeare and he loved the Greeks. Did you know that going in or did you really discover that once you were there, the degree to which he was immersed in the two cultures that you were most prepared for? Well, I think I, I knew about the Greeks for sure. Um, I had, before I went to Tokyo, I studied in London for a year. and I have an MA in Greek theater performance. And very conveniently and helpfully for the Athens Olympics, his production of Oedipus had been brought to Greece and I managed to see it in the Odeon of Herodaticus. And I had a DVD of it from, from Japan as well. So I did my thesis on that. So I arrived armed with a little bit of information. Um, the Shakespeare had been the reason that he became a name at all in London in particular. Uh, his production of Macbeth and the Medea were brought as a, a double bill to London and were a huge success in the late 1980s. And since then, a, a, a large number of his Shakespeare's had traveled. By the time I got there, he was uh, underway in a project to direct Shakespeare's complete works at the theater of which he was the artistic director. So I knew they were both in play, but what I didn't, I hadn't really picked up on was as well as these monumental and significant productions, uh, by the time of his death, he had directed productions of at least 150 other plays that were not Shakespeare or Greek tragedies. It was, I mean, an extraordinary output. Uh, but obviously Shakespeare and the Greeks were, were, were my friends too. So we had, we had that in common. Did he rely on you in any way in terms of your knowledge, being an English speaker, of the intricacies of Shakespeare's speech? And, or did he rely on Japanese translations and then direct it from the translations? I, first and foremost, I was there very much as an observer and a, a licensed observer, but I was there, they, they gave me a desk in the corner and I sat there and I observed. And my Japanese wasn't brilliant still at the time. So I was no expert and I wasn't going to be speaking as one. Um, there was one time he asked for my opinion. Um, his production of Titus Andronicus was going to the Royal Shakespeare Company for a big festival that they had. And he was playing around when the Queen of the Goths and her two horrible sons dress up as rape and murder um, to, to masquerade and, and mess with Titus outside his door. He was playing with tropes from traditional Japanese theatre and from kabuki and, and things that a Japanese audience would see were exaggerated and theatrical. But he was wondering, would, would anybody in Stratford have a clue? And so he just, he came, he sidled up to me and he asked me, do you think, and I said, I don't know. And that was enough. So they, they found a, a theatrical solution for that that would work. And it was the only vague concession to the fact that audiences who were English speakers would be seeing this production because first and foremost, his work was always for his local audience. Um, and what he considered his mission was very much to bring Shakespeare uh, to his local audience and on whatever he loved in it. So again, that, that bridge metaphor that I used earlier probably came from him, albeit the bridge he had to build was a little bit bigger. <laughs> you recently published a book this is not even your first book, uh, Shakespeare in the Theatre uh, of Yukio Ninagawa. Talk about your book. So uh, The Art in Shakespeare, uh, which is my favourite imprint of the editions of the plays uh, and so on, have a newish series uh, dedicated to various directors who have made their mark. Um, it, it's quite a, a broad ranging series. So one of the books is about um, I think the King's Men. Um, so they go back in time, but they, there have been books about many directors of note uh, and having pitched a book of some sort to various people over the years, because, you know, the, the, the time that I spent was significant and he is a major world artist. But obviously the fact that he worked in Japanese was a stumbling block. Um, 
but I had the privilege of getting to spend time in that room and my Japanese did get better. And so I pitched it to them and it was a very happy process where one of the series editors uh, who works at the Globe Theatre in London was very receptive and we had a lovely cup of coffee and she said okay and she ran it up the flagpole with the other series editors and then they sent me to Bloomsbury and to the Arden Shakespeare and everybody said yes along the way and in March of last year <laughs> after a lot of work <laughs> the, the book came to light. Just as the pandemic hit. Just yes Yes, yeah. I had lunch with a friend the day the book came out, and that is the last meal that I had in the city centre of Dublin before so everything Tell me shut a bit down. about the content of the book and what your approach is. So as I mentioned, he directed a vast quantity of material, and the, writing a book about that would, would take my whole lifetime. It took him his whole work. Um, so I concentrated exclusively on the Shakespeare, so the Greeks didn't really get to be in there although I, I snuck in a little bit about the Medea because it was very formative in his career anyway so almost every Shakespeare play uh, managed to become a Ninagawa production I think there were five that he didn't get to do before he passed away probably Antony and Cleopatra being one of them he did it oh, and a very interesting production talk um, about that production if you would because as you know it's my favorite and I never get to see it well what he did was he hired um a lady whose family were Korean. She's a Japanese actress, but uh, she's ethnically Korean. And she had come up through the all-female musical theatre review company, Takarazuka, in which she had always played male roles. So uh, completely flipping the script on how in Shakespeare's theatre, 12-year-old boys might have played Cleopatra. He had this extraordinary possibility of hiring a woman who's professional acting career had been in playing male roles who then comes in an incredibly beautiful lady as well um, to play Cleopatra so within the Japanese context she is foreign because she is Korean but she's also Japanese so she can speak the language beautifully the language being a translated version of Shakespeare by a very esteemed Japanese writer and at the same time then so this figure of Cleopatra could vibrate with all these different possibilities. Um, the musical theatre, the fact that she has a kind of a masculine energy when she needs it, as does Cleopatra. Uh, so really, it was this amazing web of references and of um, means to to make the, the the language and the story speak to a Japanese audience. And that that, in a nutshell, is the way that he did it with all of his shows. Some more accessibly than others, some more successfully than others. Um, but so the book has a lot of material. He, I mean, he directed Hamlet eight times in his career and it was his favorite play. And so I, I decided to put all of them in one chapter because the fact that he did that very early in his career and it was among the very last things he directed, there is a kind of a through line of approach or of artistic biography that I could spin and tease out of those eight productions. Um, so that, that was that was maybe the most fun chapter of the book. But then I, I tried to document and discuss uh, to an, a little extent everything I could get my hands on. But he, he left me plenty of work to do, I can tell you that. <laughs> now, I, in thinking about you and about our conversation today, it occurred to me that there's something of a through line, not necessarily with Shakespeare at all, but between the Greeks and Japanese theater in the use of masks. Mm -hmm. And I don't mean pandemic masks to protect against germ. I mean, full masks where the actor or the singer perhaps has to perform where the face is, let's say frozen because it's a mask. Um, and therefore that whole toolkit of the actor and the performers uh, skills of being able to use the eyes, the face, and so on is gone. Mm. Did you, I don't know when you've directed Greek plays, have you used masks or have you not used masks or have you ever directed in a Japanese style but a Shakespeare or a Greek play? Uh, I have not done a full show. I really want to, um, but I think I would rely, if, if it were going to be a combo between those two cultures, I would want to do it probably in Japan simply because I'd want to be drawing on experts from there. Um, whatever expertise about ancient Greece is it's putative anyway, because none of us were actually there. So slightly more 
living traditions would be better served from there. When I was in grad school, I did play around with a, a version of the back eye playing with um, the gaze of uh, Dionysus out into the audience. If you look at any drinking cup from ancient Greece, it's his eyes that look directly at us. And there's something really spooky and interesting about um, when he looks directly. And I, I don't know if there's something to that it could tie to masks or to, is that how he got people into the state of ecstasy just by staring directly at them? Because it, it doesn't happen for any other figures in art from them. So they're always in profile. There's always a, a particular difference. Whereas with him, he does look directly, which I think is, is, is fascinating. Um, in terms of the mask, it's, it's, it's interesting. For, for Greek theater, the mask is, is maybe it was something like a, a magnifier or a megaphone. Um, there are theories that perhaps there was a little bit built in to help when you're addressing 14,000 people. If you've ever seen a performance um, in somewhere like Epidaurus or the, the theater in Athens, the face of the performer is tiny. So the mask maybe is a help because it, 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 we know what it looks like and it stays the same, but also you can only barely see it. Whereas in Japanese theater, uh, in something like a, a, a no performance where they are fully masked, uh, well, the, the performers who wear masks are, have their faces totally obscured. And the expression on the mask of a no face changes depending on the angle of the head and the angle from which you're, you're seeing it, which is an amazing thing. But honestly, if you look at just, if you tilt a no mask in a particular direction, it can look threatening or serene or furious. And I mean, they're, they're very, very special masks indeed. But if you reduce the, the visibility in a room down to some candlelight and the sort of hypnotic effect of how no plays, the, the mask itself then becomes this trippy thing that you're seduced into thinking that you see it speaking or that you, you think you know what you're looking at and then it changes just from a tilt of the head. So I think both of these are very ripe for some kind of a collaboration. And if anybody listening would like me to come and have a go of it, I'm available. <laughs> well, I want listeners to know if they're not familiar with Japanese theater, that when we say no, it's spelled N-O-H. And it's a form of musical drama that dates back to the 14th century in Japan. And the masks, the no masks are carved from wood. And there's not just one type of facial expression, their whole bunch of moods but also they convey age and social rank and masks in general in the Japanese theater are very distinct and not just a mask. I think I asked you this once a long time ago but we didn't go too far with the conversation. Did you ever know of the work of someone named A.C. Scott? I think you put me on the spot last time and I'm drawing a blank. I have heard the name but yeah. Uh, some people know that I did my undergraduate degree at the University of Wisconsin, and it was oriented toward a life in opera and theater and opera production and classical music. And my major by my choice was European history and culture, because I felt that so much of what I had to know about was the history, the background, if I were to direct or manage or teach these art forms, I had to know all of the changes in Italy and the duchies and all the German states and all the <laughs> French history and the Spanish history and the British history, which to me is the hardest actually, because there've been so many rulers and, and epochs, whereas somehow Italy, I can explain better strangely enough, even though the history is longer. But my minor, uh, my major was history, my minor was theater and opera production. And A.C. Scott, Mr. Scott, as he was known to everyone, was a very famous and formidable teacher there. And he felt uh, that only a certain kind of student should be accepted by him. It was not like Veronica Dunn, where she picked you on your quality. He picked you if he felt he could grind you to powder. And his belief was that the Asian theater that he taught was about the destruction of the ego of the actor and the replacement of that with whatever the director or the playwright wanted to invest in the performer. And that didn't sit well with me, but Mr. Scott wrote many books that are very famous. Uh, one of them called the Kabuki Theater of Japan, another the Classical Theater of China. 
He wrote the puppet. That's where I know his name. He wrote many, many books, and I was with him when he was in all of his glory. And we fought endlessly, and not just me, <laughs> but he made a point of really being very tough. Um, he studied one of the first practitioners of Tai Chi before it became widely known in the West. And we all had to learn Tai Chi, which I was grateful for. Uh, also as a form of combat and interaction and movement in the body posture, which is very different of, as you well know, Connor, than Western theater. But we also had to work extensively with masks. And it was a very good education. We did a production of Waiting for Godot uh, where there's an actor and an actress in America named Jane Kaczmarek, a very well-known actress. And Jane was in the cast. I forget if she was Vladimir or Estragon, but because we're all wearing masks, um, we were not seen by our gender, so to speak. And Jane very effectively moved into being either Vladimir or Estragon. I was lucky, the character lucky. And With that monologue. Ooh. Yeah. <laughs> And we had to do Beckett in Asian, uh, the Italian say atteggiamento, posture, physicality, with the masks. And it, it was a very exciting experience, not easy. You know, we were all in physical agony after that, but it was, <laughs> it was fascinating. And, you know, a great deal can be discussed, and I know this has been and will remain a thread in your work, how these different great theatrical forms intersect. And part of what I find interesting in you is that it's not just the two, it's the three, namely the Greeks, the Shakespeare and the Japanese or the Asian. And, you know, I can imagine you were being called upon to do productions that drawn, draw from these different uh, elements. My question would be, can you envision opera with masks and i don't mean covid pandemic masks i mean mm. masks if we can get the sound out maybe just a face mask from the cheekbones up and the mouth open for singing i've se well, i've seen the latter done um i mean I've, i saw a production by akim fryer where there were huge head masks done and i actually think tomer uh is currently opening uh, doors to a variety of new possibilities. Um, and Julie I know that Taylor he... has done it in her opera productions. Yeah. Mm. I, I, I think if the, the scale of the body of the performer doesn't start to, uh, unless a production needs them to look exaggerated or cartoonish or something, that, there's, there's a politics to that. If we think of what William Kentridge does, the the hyper exaggeration of things can be really fascinating and very powerful. Um, why not? I mean, if, if a, a means is found for it, certainly masks might be a way of ensuring that opera comes back a little bit faster. Um, you know, if, if it's an extra safeguard. Um, uh, That's part of my thinking, actually. Yeah, yeah. it's it, it's interesting. I, I think we have to be the avant-garde in the original sense of what those words mean in terms of fighting our way back. We, we were the first to go and it's going to be a long time, I think, before I'm back in a rehearsal room with a Wagnerian chorus and a full orchestra and so on. Um, please let it come soon. I'm, I'm very ready for it. But the, I, I think we do have to be inventive and maybe find ways of doing things that might look a little different but might ironically bring us closer to where we were. Speaking of Wagner, I know that Nina Gawa directed a production of The Flying Dutchman in 1992. Did mm -hmm. you ever see anything, a video or any revival of that production? It's Did he Holy direct Grail. other opera? He, I don't think he had a great time doing it, but he being an immaculately well-mannered Japanese person would never be drawn. Um, it was with, um, Maestro Ozawa at his festival in Matsumoto. Um, I was run ragged trying to find any documentary evidence of it for, for my own interest. Um, the Flying Dutchman is an, is an opera that I love. Um, and Not you know, yet. You hang out with me, you'll love that opera. Oh, really? You've got about 
teach me everything. Well, no, I'm, um, so you know, people know me from my Italian work, and that's obvious. But I'm very into Wagner, and I've worked a lot on a lot of Wagner productions, and it's a magnificent opera. Here, here. Yeah, it really um, is. He, uh, Nina Gao was. It, there were talks, and some of the talks has got as far as some newspaper clippings that he was going to do the magic flute, uh, I think, for Welsh National Opera, but it did not come to pass. That is all I know. <laughs> yeah. Um, but he he loved classical music and he listened to an awful lot of Bach, particularly when he was uh, working and studying. But the, the spinning together of worlds and of references and of stories that happens in opera was not one that drew him in quite the same way, say, as Shakespeare, as contemporary Japanese drama, as the many, 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 many other things he did. Uh, it's interesting that opera did kind of uh, evade his notice as much as it did, given his proclivity for doing just about everything else. I love Japanese audiences. <laughs> they are some of the most wonderful audiences, whether we see them in Japan or whether we see them in Europe or the United States. I have an annual talk that I give at the Nippon Club here in New York, and they I even did it virtually at my most recent talk. They are so prepared and they are so polite, but not timid. They have their ideas, but they express them very, very politely and forthrightly and um i don't speak any japanese so i require a translator when i am with them if they don't speak english but would you i mean i i'll use the word special would you talk about how japanese audiences are special they mm, they it can perhaps feel that they're incredibly quiet but they are the most attentive audiences. Um, what's very what's what's bringing to mind for me right now actually is that um, uh, in in a, in this, the course of a weekend, I managed to see two Ninagawa productions. One was Othello, and one was Love's Labour's Lost. One was in Tokyo. The Othello was in Tokyo. Love's Labour's Lost was in Osaka, which is very much the Chicago of Japan. It is the second city. It has all of the associations that you would expect of a second city, including a thicker accent and better food. I was about but to say great food in Osaka. Great food. Yeah. Um, but, and I know that it was a comedy and if, if an audience was raucously laughing at Othello, I would be very nervous. But the, the exuberance of that audience was quite surprising because I had seen, for the most part, shows in Tokyo where they were much more serene and attentive and focused. But uh, the applause then at the end could go on for quite an amount of time. Um, but the Osaka audience watching this fun, bonkers production of a comedy was quite eye-opening because they were they were there to have a good time. <laughs> um, I you twice mentioned and I twice ignored what you said that you worked on a production of Madama Butterfly in Texas that was based <laughs> on Francesca Zambello production, and the reason I ignored it is because I knew I wanted to get back to the subject of Japan with you. Mm. In the chronology, where does that fit in your working life and your life in Japan? Did you do it uh, before going to Japan, after? After, after. It is possible that I got the job at Glimmerglass because the Japan thing was written on my resume. Um, I think Butterfly was, it was 10 years after I had gone to Japan, the, the first time I was in uh, Cooperstown. And uh, Cheska's production is very different in that rather than, she built it for American opera houses very much. And so the chorus are all the wives of American diplomats in Nagasaki. And a lot of the action takes place in the American consulate, um, which just means then that we're, we're not beset with any kind of concern then in terms of dressing uh, a contemporary American uh, opera chorus who will have a variety of shapes and a variety of faces and a variety of ethnicities. They're not all being dressed up to look like geisha girls or anything like that, um, which is a really deft move. Mm -hmm. um, then, so Butterfly herself is almost exclusively cast. Butterfly and Suzuki will be cast as uh, Asian or Asian American performers. And then likewise, her family, when they come to the wedding, 
as part of the show are also uh, hopefully Asian too. But that's a much smaller casting call than an entire course, obviously. Uh, she's a very clever woman, is Ara Zambello. And so, yeah, working on, it was very interesting. It's still a historical piece and it's written in 1904, I believe. Um, so it's not in any way attempting to be a depiction of Japan. And, you know, it's based on a play that Belasco saw and it, 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 there's a trickle but down Belasco there. Of, Puccini, so Belasco from San Francisco presented it in London and it was based mm -hmm. and, on a novella by a Frenchman about his experience. All the world's a stage. <laughs> from the novella and apparently mm -hmm. the, the character of Chocho San in the French novella was a lot more assertive sexually and otherwise, but became more fragile and submissive in the Belasco version, which was a play that Puccini saw in London. And as I said before about me seeing Shakespeare in Latvia, he didn't speak English but was so affected by the production that he knew mm. he wanted to make an opera of that. Um, but to... I find that Japanese people actually like the opera, that opera a lot. And I wouldn't necessarily think that a representation that is not all positive would be so appealing, um, but nonetheless, Japanese people seem to really love that opera. Is that your experience? Weirdly, I have rather minimal experience of opera in Japan, probably thanks to Nina Gawa having had no opera. I likewise then my focus stayed. Also, the performing arts in that magnificent country are so broad. There are so many doors to open and, and places to visit. Um, I, 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 I think I saw one production of Meistersinger in Tokyo. <laughs> Oi. <laughs> and that, yeah. So th that was the beginning and the end of my experience of, um, we'll call it Western <laughs> opera in Japan. Uh, I was it. due last year to see The Marriage of Figaro performed at the new National Theatre. Um, but the night before my tickets, the Japanese government shut down all theatre performances during my visit. Yeah. So that was not to be. But the... Yeah, I mean, the universality of Butterfly and the, this sort of heroic, romantic belief and faith are, are very human and understandable. And I think that that's what, what draws people to her. Did you go to Kabuki in Japan? Oh, yes, that very is, much so. Talk about, I'll talk about Kabuki after, but talk about the differences and the similarities between No, NOH theater and Kabuki? It's kind of like the difference between watching somebody read a poem by candlelight and a Broadway musical. <laughs> <laughs> um, they, I mean, they are very, very different forms. You can on occasion see the same story in a No performance and in Kabuki, but apart from them being all male companies on all sides, um, the Kabuki. They, they, they're kind of night and day, yeah. yeah. Um, Kabuki is, it, it, it's slightly younger. It's only from the 17th century as opposed to <laughs> the 14th. 14th. Um, but the, it, it's extravagant and it's loud and it's stories of warriors and courtesans. And it, it came into its own in a period, in the period when Japan was locked to the outside world and the kind of the middle class was, was developing and people had money and they had money to go to the theater. And so they wanted to go and see things happening in the theater. And the theater began to reflect, not just, you know, serene Buddhist uh, courtly values as, as get priority in no theater, so much as adventure stories and just blockbusters, I guess. Um, so the, they're an awful lot more showy and more, boisterous. Now, there, there are still and quiet moments in Kabuki too, but generally they will be quite romantic if they are quiet and there'll be terrible sadness to them. But yeah, I suppose it's the difference between a very stately and beautiful black and white and then raging, raging technicolor. Technicolor. When I was performance manager of the Met in the 1980s, regular listeners know this, um, my job was the theatre, the building, every the operations in it, so that when our opera company would leave in May and go on national tour, I, apart from one year in 1986, when I asked to go on tour, 
I remained in the theater and looked after the visiting companies we had, and it was called presentation season. And we always began with American Ballet Theater, but then we might have uh, other dance companies, opera companies, such as English National Opera, Finnish National Opera, um, modern dance, individual performers such as Yves Montand came and sang for a week and Robin Williams, the Rolling Stones, not the Rolling Stones, the Who, and all these different kinds of acts. And whatever happened in the theater, it was I was the liaison to the company. And one year, the, the woman who presented these uh, and chose them was named Jane Herman, and she was my favorite arts administrator ever, wonderful person. And Jane said to me, we're bringing in the Grand Kabuki from Japan. So you will have to work with this company and they have all of their different traditions and they have what are called living national treasures who are, there were 65 at the time in Japan and I think there were three in the company. These venerated artists who are, I mean, Veronica Dunn was a living national treasure in Ireland. Um, who could be our living national treasure in the United States? Harry Belafonte, I think, is the living national treasure here. There are a few. Cheetah Rivera. Cheetah Rivera in a different way, but I, I really there's a Cheetah Rivera is terrific, but there's a certain augustness and mm. distance that national treasures have, and Cheetah is among us, and we love her. But I think Harry Belafonte. Barbara Streisand to a certain degree because of the distance, the, the aura around her, but really Harry Belafonte, who I love. And, but in the company, the Grand Kabuki, they would bring their living national treasures who were older men. And then you had younger generations <clears throat> of performers. And there would usually be the hot young star who would be in his thirties. And this was named Thomas Saburo was the name of the, he was the 10th or the 12th or the 30th Thomas Saburo, but whoever occupies that position um, is usually the object of interest. And I was the performance manager and the Japanese with their formality and their deference referred to me as performance manager son. Hmm. And they would bow to me and I am egalitarian. I believe we're all equal in every sense, but I would nod and bow to them. And with the three national treasures, older men, they would bow deeply to me. And I was told you have to bow deeper to them. And I would practically fall over bowing to them. And then they would bow more deeply. And even though they were in their seventies, they were very limber. And I finally said, we're okay. And they said, okay, okay. <laughs> <laughs> and they were magnificent artists. But after the second or third performance, I took them out to a, a restaurant that used to be there called O'Neill's. And we ordered beers, biru, and hamburgers or cheeseburgers for everyone. We sat at a long table and we raised toast to one another. And they were all so wonderful and so collegial and so devoted to the art form. We would at that time have artists from the Soviet Union and they had a similar feeling of we're doing this for the art. Mm. And, but with the Japanese on the stage in the theater, they were absolutely on fire. And as you know, there's a platform, a ramp called the Hanamichi which is this very long diagonal platform. And we would construct the Hanamichi for the actors to come into the audience. And the Metropolitan Opera House has 3,786 seats of which about 1,500 are on the ground level. And we had to eliminate a fair amount of them. And this runway in effect would be, they would come out into the audience because it was all in Japanese. This was before projected titles, which came in 1990 we had a man named Phobian Bowers, who and you knew Phobian Bowers, maybe you can talk about him after. He would intone and we would have infrared hearing systems. And we had to give out 4,000 infrared hearing sy systems. And as they spoke in Japanese, unless you spoke Japanese, 
you'd hear these rolling tones of it is morning in Osaka. <laughs> the sky is gold. And you'd see the actors performing and speaking and so on, and the music and then the the drums. It it was a thrilling, thrilling thing. And by the time they left, we were all so sorry. And they did come back a few years later. I was happy to have them back. But in my whole career, I've seldom had an experience of so loving an entire company and an art form that was not known to me really uh, because A.C. Scott taught us no theater. He did not teach mm-hmm. this bastardized theater as he called it, of, of uh, Kabuki. <laughs> uh, you know, uh, that, that's so impressive that, you know, it, it's only 400 years old. So these rank <laughs> amateurs are in, in, in parvenus. Um, but Mr. Bowers, let me tell you, um, if it wasn't for him, we might not have Kabuki anymore. Um, Talk about him, Phobian Bowers, already is an unusual name, P-H-O-B-I-A-N, B-O-W-E-R-S. So he was stationed in Japan, I believe, during the Second World, in the aftermath of the Second World War. And Kabuki had, uh, before and during the Second World War, become incredibly nationalist and was used for all manner of propaganda. And it, it... in a weird way, it's as modern as Kabuki ever got because these were new plays that were being written for the form, um, for the, the national effort and so on. But Bowers had learned about Kabuki and knew how extraordinary it was. And he lobbied to make sure that it was not totally outlawed because in the same way that we're talking about gaps in tradition and in transmission, um, the, the the death toll, but also the... The, the pause in performances that had happened because of Japanese um, military operations for a lot of the first portion of the 20th century, not just World War II, but, you know, bear in mind, Japan took on China and Russia and won both of those conflicts. So that, you know, a, a huge amount of that, but certainly the USA and the sanctions and the aftermath of the war and so on, Kabuki was all but canceled but Bowers lobbied to ensure that it could be allowed to, to reopen under certain strict parameters and so on. But th- there is a lovely book called, I think it's called The Man Who Saved Kabuki. And ah. it's all about, all about that. So yeah, he, he's, he's a very important person in the history of the forum. And again, a Westerner yep. the, the, who happened to fall in love with it. So I, I'm thrilled to hear this. <laughs> I would have loved to have been out at those shows and hear him live narrating them like that. That sounds like a treat. So I know that in Japanese, they say sayonara. Mm-hmm. In Italian, we say arrivederci, beast next to small. How do you say it in ancient Greek? I should have known you'd ask me that, shouldn't I? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, in Latin, it would be something like ave atque vale or wale, depending on how, who taught you Latin. In Greek, I can say it in, in modern Greek, which Go would ahead. just be, well, kalinista. Which is probably the same in ancient Greek, which is good night. <laughs> and how do you say it in Gaelic? Ihawa. That's the best. It sounds Japanese. Say it again. Ihawa. That's Japanese. <laughs> I promise you it's Irish. <laughs> Connor, thank you for this wonderful visit. And I know that you have inspired my listeners, my audience, and your audience uh, with your work, but also now with this conversation, because we went down many roads. And may the, how did the IRA say it? May the rose, road always rise and meet you at your back. What is the expression? May the road rise up to meet you and may the wind always be at your back. Very good. And may that be for you. And may, when this pandemic eases, I don't think we'll ever be done with it fully, but when it eases and we are in a new way of living, I hope to see you soon. And I also hope to see very soon work that you will do. I meant to, meant to mention one more thing. You have done a Hamlet podcast. I said about an hour ago, we're going to talk about Hamlet. Tell us briefly about your Hamlet podcast. Well, four years ago, in in a moment of mild unemployment, uh, I had been listening to a lovely other podcast. I'm going to send you to somebody else first. Um, A brilliant Irish broadcaster called Frank Delaney had a podcast about Ulysses, the James Joyce novel, in which he would take it a paragraph at a time in little five minute sections and explain it. And 
had it not been for him, I would never have got through that book because it, he, he did a, a beautiful public service with it. Um, the, the tragedy is that he died before he finished going mm -hmm. through and enlightening the book altogether. Um, but as even a, a, a taster and an introduction, I can recommend it more wholeheartedly than anything else. Uh, and then at some point during that summer, I was thinking, if I was ever to do a podcast, what, what would I do it about? And I sort of happened upon the idea of Hamlet, particularly because of all, for all my love for Shakespeare and so on, I never really wanted to direct it, which I thought was troublesome because it is the Shakespeare play and it's the most famous and so on. So I thought, well, maybe I'd spend some time with it. And the, the format I kind of robbed from Frank Delaney, which was that I would take 20 lines per week and talk about what's going on. And so some weeks the episode is a little bit longer and some weeks there are 20 line passages in Hamlet when almost nothing happens. So be it. And so it's been going for almost four years now and uh, it finishes this summer on my 40th birthday will be the last episode. This I seem to remember now, now remembering your birthday. Um, this year, 2021, is also the 800th anniversary of the death of Dante. And in Italy, they're doing similar things. Roberto Benigni has recited all of Dante, the great actor of the past, Vittorio Gossman. Each night at midnight would do five minutes of Dante on the Italian television network and the whole nation before going to bed would tune in for five minutes of Dante. And I think there is a future in this kind of simultaneous broadcasting. Nothing replaces live theater ever, 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 or live opera, live concerts. But um, I think it's an interesting way for people to have their pause. Here in New York, our station WNYC, the public radio program, every day at one o'clock now has a minute of meditation and there's a meditation leader and millions of New Yorkers tune in to meditate and just exhale and breathe mm -hmm. and get the tension out of our bodies. And so given that I have my guests join me at two o'clock, I do the one minute meditation at one o'clock and then I'm ready to meet my guests. So my friend, thank you. Um, I will see you, I hope very soon and keep up the good work. It's always a joy to talk to you. Thanks for having me. Thank you.